So um, we'll start off today um, with a land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge the sacred land where we are today, which has been and continues to be the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River, among many other unnamed and unrecognized Indigenous communities. At this location, we stand on land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. We recognize this agreement not as a thing of the past, but as a promise today and into the future. We must share the responsibility of ensuring that the dish is never empty by taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with and transforming our personal and institutional relationships. This meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this land. We urge you as future Canadian healthcare practitioners and leaders to acknowledge that it is our collective responsibility to strengthen our ties within the communities we serve and practice healthcare in a way that advances the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's seven health-related recommendations and practice your profession in that spirit. Now for this afternoon's agenda, um, we'll just go talk about why Michener is the right place to study, the advantages of being at Michener. You'll hear from our faculty, our chair, and Vanessa uh, during a discussion. We'll, um, my colleague Dylan will talk about the application process and tuition and other fees, and um, we'll go through a live Q&A and answer as many questions as we can. So why study at Michener? Michener advantage. So Michener has a singular focus. We have no distractions from our primary mission to educate health professional and fulfill health human resources strategies of Ontario. We are part of the healthcare system. So since 2016, Michener is integrated with Canada's top hospital network, UHN. Um, this consists of Toronto General, Toronto Rehab, Toronto Western, and Princess Margaret, and this provides Michener students immersion in patient care from day one. Experiential learning. So our programs really believe in that hands-on experience. 89% of Michener grads are satisfied with Michener preparing them for job success. And we are career-driven. So 97% of Michener graduates are employed in a job related to their field one year after graduation. So it's over to you now, Grace. Thank you so much, um, Teresa. And now we are going to move on to the panel discussion. Our first program of the day is actually our newest program. Um, it has been recently launched. We will have our first intake this winter 2024. Um, it is the magnetic resonance imaging first discipline, and it's a direct entry program. Um, with that said, um, I'm going to start asking questions specifically um, about the program, how unique the program is, and I'd like to invite our um, wonderful chair, Amy, to address the first question. So the first question, Amy, is that what what makes this program or the profession unique or for fulfilling? And to top it off, this is now a direct entry program. That's right. Thanks, Grace. The MRI First Discipline program is designed to be a hybrid program, allowing students to participate both, both online and face-to-face -face in MRI and related subject matter. In this first entry program, open to students directly out of high school, amongst others, Didactic courses will be delivered by expert faculty to build students' knowledge space. Hands-on clinical teaching will take place during clinical placements in affiliated hospitals and diagnostic imaging centers. Graduates of the program will be able to provide effective and compassionate care for patients while carrying out diagnostic medical imaging procedures in the specialty of MRI. This full-time program will prepare students to operate sophisticated medical imaging equipment, communicate with patients, 
and participate as essential members of the interprofessional healthcare team. The program encourages students to develop the necessary te technical, critical thinking, and problem solving skills to complete and adapt MRI procedures based on a patient's medical condition. Awesome, that's really great, Amy. Um, another question that we would like to ask you is who is this program designed for? Um, we understand that this, this is really like a very new program. Um, recently, it, I mean, in the past, we used to offer this as a second entry program for um, students who already have like imaging um, background from before or maybe a professional in their field. Um, but now, who is this program designed for them? Yeah, great. This program is designed for um, anyone, including those who don't have a healthcare background. So that's where when we said that it's, um, you can apply right out of high school, if you meet the admission requirements, you can um, enter this program through that pathway, as well as some other pathways. So um, the program is designed for someone who might be interested in healthcare, um, but doesn't necessarily have a background in it. That's amazing. That's really great. And it makes the program much more, I would say, accessible also for those students who would like to really mm -hmm. uh, look into maybe second careers and also interested to move into a different path in their careers, which is essentially in healthcare. Amazing. Thank you, Amy. Um, I sure. think we have, go ahead, Amy. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, the other Question two, that I think you might have browsed a little bit um, while introducing the program is, what are the necessary background or skills um, that would be required from someone who's taking this program, or I would say becoming like an MRI technologist? So from my perspective, I would say somebody who's interested in um, uh, technology, who's also interested in people, right? You're gonna be interacting with people all, all day long as an MR tech, whether it's your patients or your colleagues. So those are two of the big things um, that I would say that, that would be good backgrounds. Amazing. The other thing that students might also be asking is that will we be teaching some of the physics um, as part of the curriculum, assuming, let's say, for example, because this is a, uh, I mean, a, 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 a first discipline program, like a direct entry, um, would the foundational, I, I think I'm go going to rephrase my question, but would the basic or fundamental, I would say, disciplines be taught as part of the curriculum as well? I'm sorry, I lost that last part of your question. Sorry, can you hear me, um, Amy? I can hear you. I just missed the last okay. part of the question. Yeah, so um, I was rephrasing the question in terms of like, would um, the curriculum, in terms of the curriculum, would that involve um, teaching the students some, some sort of physics as being part of the curriculum itself? Or um, would they be expected to have some sort of like um, knowledge about physics before they get into the program? Another great question, Grace, no. Um, high school physics is not a requirement for the application and you will be getting all you need um, in the program, in the coursework to um, learn all you need to know about physics related to MRI. That's great. I think it opens up a lot of opportunities for students who didn't really have foundational um, courses from before to be able to apply for this program. Thank you, Amy. Yeah. Um, and then, um, one of the big questions that are always being asked from us is um, essentially about how many intakes per year are there for the MRI first discipline and maybe how many seats um, are there avail available for one intake? Mm. We have two intakes happening in 2024, one in January that we've talked about and one in September. And right now we have 24 seats for each of those intakes. Um, after 2024, we'll only be having one intake a year and that happens in September. Great, thank you. So to clarify for our um, participants for today, our viewers that um, there will only be one intake per year after the, the 2024 academic year. Um, and then that said, Amy, 
Um, would you be able to describe how classes will be conducted for the MRI first discipline? And then how many hours would students be typically in their classes, whether it will be virtual or in person? Thanks, Grace. Um, the question is that the questions, the um, classes will primarily be uh, delivered virtually with some on site lab work. Um, and the hours are um, expected, to, students are expected to be in class. I think that's about 20, 24 hours a week. So it's anywhere from three to six hours a day, depending on what classes you've got scheduled. That's great. And then would the didactic components of the program always be um, synchronous or asynchronous in terms of, you know, online learning? They'll be, they'll be synchronous. Thanks for asking. No problem. Thank you. Um, and then the other thing that we also hear from our students, especially prospective students, is that how many hours would they need to allocate or dedicate for their own self-study outside of like the um, instructional hours? It's a difficult question to answer because every student is different, right? Every student has different study habits and concentration abilities, and some students may be coming directly from you know, the, a previous educational experience and some students maybe take a little bit longer. But I would say, I was speaking with someone else about this today, that if, if you allot, if the students allot six to 10 hours a week extra um, for independent study, that should be adequate, a minimum, I should say, six to 10. So sort of an hour to two for each of your classes. Yeah, that, that's, that's going to be very helpful for our future students. Thank you for um, providing that, um, Amy. And then I think, Next is more about lab and practical work. Of course, Michener's strength has always been, um, you know, very much patient care focus, um, exposure to simulated clinical and all that. Um, for their labs, would you be able to describe how the lab classes for this program will be designed and then what kinds of equipment would they be learning? Sure. Um, again, like some of the other stuff we've talked about, it's, it's um, a hybrid model. So there is some virtual labs and some um, in-person labs. An example of the virtual lab might be using some MRI simulation education software you might do in a virtual lab type environment. Um, our on-site or in-person labs include our anatomy lab, which has anatomy specimens for students to examine, our patient care lab. Students will practice using various types of equipment like wheelchairs, stretchers, and lifts to help maneuver patients safely. They'll have opportunities to have hands-on skills such as setting up IVs and practicing obtaining CTs in a CT unit. That's great. Um, it's great to know as well that they'll be learning how to use some of the um, commonly used tools in the hospitals and essentially focusing on patients say, safely as well. That's, that's really um, great. And then I think that the next thing that we will be covering for today um, would be about clinical placement. Um, we have been um, asked so much about clinical exposure, the simulated clinical. Um, would you be able to describe and differentiate between like the clinical semester from the simulated clinical or whether there is really a simulated clinical um, semester for this program? Well, your, um, a student's clinical semester is going to be a full-time experience, learning experience in the clinical environment, um, working with your MRI colleagues. So it, it's, um, you're, you're actually working with patients in the real world um, and, and learning to apply your learning um, to, what you, to your knowledge base. Um, Students can expect, as I said, it's full time, 37 and a half hours a week in clinical environments. So you can expect to be uh, on site at your clinical for full time. Um, there are two clinical semesters in the program, and they happen at the end of the um, at the end of the program. So you have three didactic uh, semesters followed by two semesters back to back that are clinical semesters. Right. Is there anything else I can let you know, I think I sort of went all over the place with that. No, no, absolutely. I think the, the you have described it pretty well. And then um, I think just the emphasis that there would be two clinical semesters 
um, throughout the program. If you don't mind me asking, Amy, how many semesters um, is the new program um, going to have? Like, is it six or seven it's, semesters? It's five semesters. Five semesters. Five semesters. Got it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, and Welcome. that said, um, I think we are going to move on to the next set of questions, which is more on professional licensing. Um, is this the same as other imaging programs like sonography where in they'll be having like licensing requirements? And if they do, would you mind describing how the process works? Sure, maybe, um, do you mind if I ask Shahida to answer that one? Sure, absolutely. Go ahead, Shahida. Feel comfortable. Sorry, Grace, can I ask you to repeat the question, please? Yeah, no problem, Shahida. So um, typically our students, especially prospective students would want to understand uh, whether there would be any licensing requirements from for this particular profession. Is it the same as other imaging professions like sonography were in, there would be a licensing requirement. And if there are any, um, would you be able to describe how the process works? Sure. Um, so once you graduate from the program, you will be eligible to write the Canadian National Certification Exam, which is administered by a body called CAMRT, um, also known as the Canadian Association of Medical Radiation Technologists. Um, so after passing, once, once you graduate from the program, you write the certification exam administered by CMRT. After you pass the cert certification exam, you can work anywhere in Canada. However, some provinces have provincial regulatory bodies. Therefore, you have to meet the criteria to work in that specific province. So I'll give you an example. For example, Ontario, for instance, the CMRITO, CMRITO regulates MRTs to ensure safe and competent practice. So therefore in Ontario, an MRI technologist must register with this regulatory body in order to practice in Ontario. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. And um, thank you for explaining that, you know, you might have to complete some other professional or licensing exams depending on the province. Um, so that's really um, that's really great, Shahida. Um, the next set of questions would be more on career prospects. Um, maybe Shahida, you could answer this first and then Amy, you could um, chime in. So about career prospects, where can the graduates work? Um, of course, hospitals would be the main thing. Um, but are there any other uh, prospects that students can go to after graduating from the program? Yeah, so like you said, they can work uh, in any hospital setting. There's private clinics and a lot more private clinics are popping up now in MR um, due to an initiative by the ministry in Ontario, Health Ministry in Ontario. Graduates can also work as an application specialist or product sales with a vendor like Siemens or GE or Philips or Canon or Toshiba. Um, graduates can work in the education sector like myself. Um, you can work as clinical preceptors in a clinical setting uh, where you work with and train students. You can work in research. Um, you can work internationally as long as you meet the criteria to work in that specific country. Thank you, Shane, that that's really helpful. Um, and then once they are employed, would you be able to describe what a typical work day of an MRI technologist would look like? Sure. Um, I hope you don't find this too detailed, but I'll try to describe oh, it. Okay, sure. <laughs> okay, so MRI uses a powerful magnet for imaging, so we don't want anything metallic or electronic inside or around the MRI unit. Therefore, one of the most important responsibilities we have as MRI technologists is ensuring both patient and public safety in and around the MRI environment. So in MR, patient appointments are scheduled. So that means it's not a walk-in service. Therefore, it's important to be efficient and stay on time so that 
patients receive their MRI exams at their scheduled times. Some patients have to fast for their exams. So for instance, we have pelvic and abdominal MRI exams where the patient has to be NPO, where they can't eat anything four to six hours prior to the exam. So it's also important to stay on schedule so that fasting patients are not kept waiting for extended periods of time. Now, when you arrive for your shift, after greeting your team, you don the required PPE, which is your personal protective equipment, according to your organization's policies and procedures. And because of our the recent pandemic, that has been implemented in a lot of organizations as part of their policies and procedures for healthcare workers to wear PPE when working directly with patients. So you have to follow your hospital's uh, policy and procedures as far as PPE is concerned. So, you know, a, a common example of PPE is a, a, a mask or a face shield so that you're protected when you're working directly with patients. And some of the patients have isolation precautions. So you debrief with your team members and you consider what needs to get done next. So for instance, you may need to take over a case from a team member because it's the end of their shift or they need to go for their meal break. Or you may need to go prep the next patient in the schedule so that they're ready for their MR exam. It's very important to have the next patient in the schedule prepared and ready to go because this optimizes the workflow and avoids delays in between patients. So what's patient prep, what does patient prep looks like? Well, first of all, it takes time and it includes tasks like um, verbal and written safety screening to ensure that the patient does not have any contraindicated implants or devices in or on their bodies. Because remember, the MRI unit is a magnet, it's a powerful magnet. We have to change patients into MRI safe gowns, um, ask the patients to remove their jewelry and safely lock up their belongings in uh, lockers that the organization provides. Uh, we initiate IVs or venipuncture. So we have to have intravenous access for patients that require contrast injections to, to be administered for their MRI exams. So MRI technologists, as part of their training, they get trained in IV access or venipuncture. Now, before beginning, beginning the MRI exam, we ensure the exam room is clean. We set up any ancillary imaging equipment that's necessary for that particular exam. Then we position the patient on the equipment or you position the equipment on the patient and provide necessary patient instructions. You, we use state-of-the-art equipment and software. We, we perform and monitor the MRI exam according to the prescribed protocols, which are prescribed by the radiologist. And if needed, we adapt the procedure according to the patient's condition. Now, some patients feel claustrophobic in the MRI unit, and those patients may need additional supports to complete their MRI exams. Almost done. Um, we ensure that all exams are performed correctly, which means we also check for any irregularities and address all discrepancies. We complete post-processing on select data acquisitions. We ensure that the patient's needs are met before we release them. And after the exam, we clean the equipment and prepare the exam room for the next patient. Uh, you have to clean all equipment after each use, especially after uh, the recent pandemic, what that has taught us. And we also organize MRI exams for hospital inpatients. So if you are work in a hospital setting, there's inpatients that require MRI exams. So part of our duties is our organizing MRI exams for them as well. Now, generally in terms of workflow and work distribution, the way it works in MRI, MRI is MRI techs in a team setting alternate between preparing and scanning patients. So for instance, the first scheduled patient arrives, you prepare that patient, and then you perform their MRI exam. While you're performing that patient's uh, MRI exam, your colleague is preparing the next scheduled patient, and they would then perform that patient's exam. While they're doing that, you go and prepare the patient after that, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, that is a very detailed um, description of how a day in the life of an um, MRI technologist is. And um, yeah, I've, I've actually accompanied my, my dad like going to an MRI and it is really a tedious work because you need to really, I mean, I've observed the MRI technologies like really helping out the patient, making sure that they're they're comfortable. So it's really like patient facing. So thank you, Shahida. That was really a great description of what would um, 
you know, our future students will be looking into once they get, get into the profession. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think like the next thing that we want to discuss and share with our um, participants is the student experience. And today we have Jennifer who has kindly um, joined our webinar today. She is a recent graduate of the MRI second discipline program. However, her experiences would also be attesting to how the program actually works. And so um, I have a few questions for you, um, for you, Jennifer. And the first, Jen, uh, the first question is really, why did you choose to become an MRI technologist or why did you choose to apply for this program? Um, so I really like imaging and I like working with patients. So that was, and also uh, that was, those were the two things that really made me um, go towards this program. Uh, you really get to work with uh, the technology and you get to see the anatomy of patients, which is very um, something that I'm really interested, I was really interested about. So that's why I went towards this uh, MRI program. Amazing, thank you. Um, and then could you just briefly describe what's it like being a Michener student? So uh, Michener, I love my, loved my experience uh, at Michener, both um, in my previous program and in my MRI program. I had amazing, ex I had an amazing experience. Um, there's small class. So my first program was all, it was radiation therapy was all in, uh, in class and it's a small environment. You get to know all your classmates and your teachers, they're amazing. And with uh, MRI, um, this program was online. Again, the, the professors are amazing. They um, answer all your questions. They're very supportive of you. Like you can reach out to them and um, ask many like questions. They'll um, help you out as best as they can. Um, like they're very good at guiding you and uh, getting you through, like if you have any struggles in course materials, um, they're there for you, and like even throughout your clinical placement, step by step, they're they're there. They're helping you throughout the entire program. So like my uh, experience at Michener was good. Um, the teachers prepared you. So the teachers really prepare you for your clinical placement. So the didactic is one component, but then your clinical placement is another component. And uh, definitely the teachers, uh, the professors, they prepare you to. Um, succeed in the clinical placement. And if you put in your part, um, the teachers, the professors are there if you need, if you need them to, uh, for support, uh, you're able, you'll, you'll be able to succeed in both the didactic and the um, uh, clinical placement. And even when you go to clinical, uh, the preceptors and the clinical coordinators there, they're very supportive as well. Um, so I, like my experience at Michener is very, uh, like it was very positive and Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm sure those, um, you know, those experiences that you have just shared would be really um, helpful to our um, prospective students who are listening right now. Um, and one final um, question. What would be your advice to future students of this program? Um, essentially for, you know, preparing your application. And at the same time, maybe um, just a few words about like managing your course load while, um, you know, in the program. Um, <clears throat> preparing your application. Um, I, this is a first, like, I'm not really sure about the prerequisites for this first discipline program. Um, but my, my prerequisites that I had to do uh, to get into the radiation therapy and then to MRI I needed, um, like I came in after with an undergraduate degree to my mm -hmm. radiation therapy program. And then um, with, the, uh, with the radiation therapy program, I was able to get into MRI as a second discipline. But I know this is um, a new program and I think the prerequisites are a bit different. Um, but- yeah. Uh, yeah. Think, yeah. Sorry to cut you off, Jennifer. Like in general, like what would be your advice to the students when you know, um, 
applying to this program and then just like making sure, of course, maybe you could um, probably focus your answer now more on like on the course mode, right? Like how yeah. do you manage your time? So the course, I can speak towards the course load. Um, the course load is reasonable, but again, like they said, you do have to put in the time. You have to, you have to, um, you know, refer your material before you go to um, the lecture. And then once you've done the lecture, you should try and refer it afterwards as well. Uh, but once, if you keep on top of your material, you're definitely, um, you know, you're definitely like going towards uh, succeeding in the program. So you have to be like, it, you have to do time management, um, make sure that you're studying and uh, keeping on track of your material. Uh, definitely those things are um, important to succeed in this program. But again, like I said, there's a lot of support. Um, uh, the teacher, the professors, they provide you with support. If you are um, struggling with a question, they they are there, and um, they're there to they they ha they help you with uh, trying to get you to understand the material. So thank you, Jennifer. That's really, I mean, a very great um, advice for for students who will be um, attending the program or currently. Um, thinking of applying into the MRI program. Um, and so that wraps up our um, presentation for the MRI First Discipline. And now we're moving on to our second U program. This was launched last year. It's the Fundamentals of Healthcare program. And so um, this is a more of like a panel discussion as well. If you could go over to the next slide, um, Teresa. So Fundamentals of healthcare um, would be, you know, there would be more information shared by our wonderful chair, Amy. Um, if I could invite you to start speaking about how the program works and a few more information about what makes this program unique. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, Amy. Yeah. Great. Great. The Fundamentals of Healthcare Diploma Program offers learners a self-paced, flexible, and fully customizable program to explore and prepare them for careers across the healthcare spectrum. Whether graduates intend to work in a healthcare setting or enroll in further healthcare education, this program provides pathways to a multitude of possibilities. It was developed in collaboration with the University Health Network, and the program can be taken full or part-time. It consists of 20 courses, eight of which are required, and students are given flexibility in the choice and the sequence of the courses they take. Thank you, Amy. Um, but something about this program as well is, is there any you know, skills or background that the students should have um, in order to succeed in the program or whatever particular pro um, profession that the student would get into after graduation? Those are some great questions, Grace. I think because of the diversity of the courses that we're offering in this program, I think it really is going to appeal to a lot of different people with different skills. Um, again, I would say if you're interested in healthcare, uh, you're liking working with people is probably a big thing because you're either going to be working with patients or you're likely going to be working with a team. So that's a big one. But I think that this um, diverse program offers a lot of variety for different different types of students. Yeah, that's that's really, I think, attractive for most of students, especially who are wanting to look into healthcare. Maybe if they're not really quite sure of um, what specialization do you want to get into? Um, I think fundamentals of healthcare would provide them with some sort of exposure in it. Um, if you don't mind me asking, Amy, um, is there any apprenticeship associated with the program? Um, yeah, we're actually developing several apprenticeship agreements right now, which are gonna offer Perfect. learners the opportunity to work in healthcare while they're, in, while they're studying in the program. So we are just uh, just starting to develop those agreements. That's really exciting um, development about the program. Thank you, Amy, for sharing that. 
Um, and so, yeah, um, the next um, sets of questions would be dealing more about um, classes and curriculum. So would you be able to describe like how many classes will the students be taking? Let's say, for example, if they will be doing a full time um, path, um, remember that this program is flexible wherein students can choose to elect um, full time um, attendance status or a part time status. Um, and then like how would the classes be conducted? Um, maybe let's start with those two. In Okay, um, so students can take, I think you really summarized it, take, students can take as many or as few as they like um, of the classes. It's really flexible. Full time is um, five classes a semester, I believe. Um, uh, but if you're not interested in taking it full time, you can really take as many as you want um, as they're offered as, as they're offered because each course is not necessarily offered every semester. Um, classes will be conducted online synchronous. Any other, anything else, Grace? Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to follow up as well in terms of like, I, probably you might have said this earlier, but I just want to make sure we um, repeat it for our um, students who are um, listening to us. Like how many courses would the students be required to take in order for them to graduate from the program, considering that this is a very flexible, um, self-based um, program? Right, so they, they graduate with the 20, 20 credits. Perfect, thank you. And then um, for from your perspective, if the students will be taking it um, like on a part-time basis, um, how many years do you approximately anticipate a student would be able to complete the program? Uh, well, I'll have to do my math quickly about that, but like I said- um, <laughs> Sorry to put you on this. <laughs> It really depends on the, the individual and they can slow it up or, and speed it down throughout that time period too. They can take one course a semester or they can take three or they can take five. So if the full-time program takes two years, then part-time I would say, you know, four years if you're, if you're taking a couple of courses each semester. Right. But like I said, it's very yeah. flexible. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. And um, speaking of classes and curriculum, um, again, this is one of the things that students also tend to ask about um, practical applications. So clinical or practical, um, is there any clinical or practicum semesters in the program? I know you have spoken a little bit about apprentice, apprenticeship, but would you mind expounding on this? Um, what we're looking at is, um, placing those students who are interested in pursuing uh, an apprenticeship um, into that role, that position, that paid position within one of our partner organizations so that you can work and maybe even take a course or two while you're, while you're um, working a few days a week, you can take a few courses with the fundamentals program um, at, as an apprentice. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, we're hoping to hear more about the apprenticeship program perhaps in the next few months to come. So that's really exciting. Um, and sure. then, and, and just, yeah, go ahead. I was just clarify, uh, it's not a requirement. The, to participate in the apprenticeship is not a requirement, but it is an opportunity that we might like to have for some students. Great, yeah, that's really good to know, Amy, um, that it is strictly voluntary. And then, of course, now that we are in the topic of like clinical um, placements and practicum, um, what would be the career prospects um, for the students like after their graduation from this program? Well, again, it's quite varied, right? Everybody's going to end up with slightly different um, skill sets. Um, but of course, I think most people are looking at healthcare settings, um, healthcare environments, maybe some clinical clinic environments, long-term care, et cetera. Those are the types of places that people might be interested. But of course, they could also um, look for opportunities in research and sales as well um, with this background. Mm -hmm. Those are really good variety of 
um, careers after graduating from this program. I didn't even think about like um, even medical sales, right? So that's really great to know. Um, and of course, would there be, um, I know that this program is so unique in such a way that it will allow some education pathways, right? So um, mm. what would be the pathways from the FHC program into the advanced diploma programs, if ever? I mean, I'm talking about like within Michener, like advanced diplomas. Yeah. Yeah, we will have pathways established into all of our advanced uh, diploma programs. Um, of course, applicants would still have to meet admission requirements, but some of the fundamentals of healthcare courses may actually meet those requirements. So we will have pathways established into all of our advanced diploma programs. Perfect. Yeah, um, I I believe like most of our students who are, you know, wanting to apply for this program are asking whether they could um, go into um, the FHC program and eventually be able to specialize like after graduation. Um, and so that's really great to know. I think the mm -hmm. other thing that, yeah, um, the other question that we often get asked about is if they take some FHC courses, um, and then, for example, they successfully transitioned into the advanced diploma programs at Michener, would they be receiving exemptions or advanced spending? Yep, we can do that as well. So courses from the fundamentals program will be considered based upon their competencies. So we match them up with um, the, the courses that you're looking at and getting exempted from. Um, but we do have some of those, for example, the courses research methods, anatomy and physiology, and the healthcare ecosystem, which are in the fundamentals program right now, um, would would be an exemption for similar courses in some advanced diploma courses already. Thank you. And also just to add on as well, um, this year we have started offering like I think anatomy and physiology under the FHC umbrella. And um, those Whoever have taken that course, that is actually equivalent as a prerequisite for prerequisite fulfillment for our advanced diploma program. So if anyone is, um, you know, we already um, started the enrollment for that, unfortunately, but then um, that actually fulfills course prerequisites specific to anatomy and physiology for other um, full-time programs at the Michener. So thank you for clarifying that, Amy. And that said, um, now we're wrapping up our conversation about um, the fundamentals of healthcare. We're moving on to our final program of the day, which is the Digital Health and Data Analytics um, Program. So Amy, again, this is on you. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a few questions about um, the digital, digital health and data analytics program. This is quite unique, to be honest, um, in terms of like the program offerings at Michener, because this is more of like, you know, a combination between someone who has um, an information management um, background and then who's also interested in application of that background into like very specialized, which is um, healthcare. So that said, would you be able to tell us more about this program and what makes this so unique? Sure. Um, Mitchner's program, Digital Health and Data Analytics, is a comprehensive four semester program dedicated to training learners in digital health, artificial intelligence or AI, data analytics, machine learning, and virtual care. This program was purpose-built for learners who see themselves as contributing to the rapidly evolving digital world and its impact on healthcare. Designed to be pragmatic, practical, and job-oriented, this unique cutting-edge program will prepare you for an exciting career in digital health, data science, and AI in healthcare and beyond. Great. Thank you, um, Amy. And I think this is, like I've mentioned earlier, it's one of the unique programs that our, um, you know, our um, Michener is currently offering. And then um, the other thing that we want to ask you is, would there be any specific skills or background that students will, or um, applicants into this program 
would need to have first um, to be successful in the program? Well, the program is designed for university graduates, IT professionals, and current healthcare practitioners who are interested in the introduction and integration of digital solutions and key topics and initiatives in the healthcare and consulting fields. But I would say someone um, as well, someone who can see themselves as a bridge between healthcare and the digital and the technology, someone like that is likely to succeed in the program. Someone who's a good communicator and who understands what the goal of a problem is. And also problem solvers that can take ideas, but make them have um, solution solution oriented. Amazing, thank you, Amy. If I were younger, I would have taken this program as my graduate certificate. Um, so um, if we could move on to the next slide, um, Teresa, thank you. Um, this is just probably, can you talk about um, the difference now or, you know, DHDA is now a graduate certificate program. So would you be able to talk about what are the changes um, with, you know, the new program curriculum or um, now that it is um, considered as a graduate certificate program? Sure, and actually, I'm not sure what slides you're on because I can't see you guys right now, but if you want to be oh, on the slide that has... The, yeah, so we are now at the current programming and, the, the, and then the 2024. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, current programming is that we are issuing an advanced diploma for this program. It requires a bachelor's degree for admission, but it's six semesters, and it also includes in those six semesters a practicum option. Moving for 2024 onwards, we're now going to be issuing the credential of a graduate certificate. Again, you still need a bachelor's degree is required, but it's only going to be a four semester program. We've removed the practicum placement. We found that um, over the first couple of years of running the program, there were some challenges related to running the practicum um, option. And in fact, many students were leaving um, before the practicum. So we found uh, that uh, the program is better placed to offer industry partnerships in, this, in the four didactic semesters now, having eliminated the practicum placement. Perfect. And um, Amy, would you know whether there has been any changes to the admission requirements um, now that it is a graduate certificate or did it change? Um, did it stay the same? It stayed the same. Thanks for asking, Grace. No problem. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. So for those of you who are interested to apply to the graduate certificate program, just to reiterate, um, though the credential has changed to graduate certificate, the admission requirements is still the same. Um, which would require someone to have graduated from a bachelor's degree and a statistics course, a basic statistics course. Um, thank you for that, Amy. Um, if you could move on to the next slide, Teresa, thank you. So um, again, classes, um, how will the classes be conducted in the new curriculum? And then roughly, would you have more online synchronous classes for the graduate certificate and how many hours would the students need to dedicate for their self-study? Um, so the classes haven't changed in the new curriculum at all and how they're delivered. Um, it's just the elimination of the practicum semesters. Um, so they are um, online virtual synchronous and asynchronous classes. Um, in a typical day, students, I think for this class, and actually Vanessa, our, our student um, who's joined us today can clarify with me, I think this, this group meets uh, synchronously for three hours a week and then does another, uh, there are two other classes um, asynchronously during the week. So that's how many hours you're expected to be in class. And how many hours do students need to dedicate for self-study? I'm going to say it again. It probably depends on the student. Um, and again, maybe Vanessa can speak to how much um, how much study she dedicates to self study. Great, that that's really wonderful, and it's good to know, Amy, that um, it's. I mean, the classes will still be the same. Um, the only difference is that it's the um, practicum piece that um, is no longer included in the, to the program. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, sure. And and so um, I. 
actually looked at or peeped at your curriculum, um, the new graduate certificate. Um, so dealing with more lab or practical work um, for this program, would you be able to tell us, um, you know, something about the applied project course in the fourth and final semester of DHDA? Of course. In this course, students will develop a project that will showcase the advanced knowledge and skills that they've acquired during the program through consultation with a key stakeholder in a related area of digital health data analytics or artificial intelligence. The project will form an invaluable piece of their professional portfolio that students can use to demonstrate to potential employers in the field that they are ready to be part of a high performing team. As part of a team, students will focus on one of the primary program streams of artificial intelligence, intelligence, pardon me, machine learning, robotics, or data science. Students will apply their skills in design thinking and implementation science to maximize potential impacts for the healthcare system while ensuring feasibility and facilitating robust evaluation. Students will also have an opportunity independently to consider a practical issue related to bias, equity, or accessibility that might impact the team project. Wow, that, that's really very interesting. I mean, my background is more in systems and then, you know, data, that's really like a dream job, I would say. Um, and so mm -hmm. now that we have kind of like, you know, brushed upon like the lab and practical work, I'm sure our students who are listening right now are interested in career prospects as well. So after graduating from the DHDA, where can the students work? Uh, students who graduate from DHDA can work in hospital-based opportunities, imaging departments, work with data analytics, organizations, government agencies. Um, they might work in startups or work with electronic health records automation. Wow, that's really cool. Um, thank you, Amy. Um, and so that kind of like wraps up the conversation about the program itself. And we're interested to hear from our student ambassador, Vanessa. Um, I'd like to first ask you, why did you choose the Digital Health and Data Analytics Program at Michener? Thanks, Grace. I come from a healthcare background. So um, I studied kinesiology and I worked in research after graduation. Um, and a lot of my experience is more on the clinical side of things. Um, but I did get some exposure in my research to data analytics and data science. Um, so that's really why I went into this program was to learn more about the technology aspect within healthcare. And specifically, I was interested in learning some programming skills, um, but in a healthcare lens. So this program was interesting to me from that standpoint. Wow, well, that's a very good, um, you know, um, you know, sharing of your experience and then your background as well and what triggered you to choose this program, Vanessa. Um, I know that you're a first year student for DHCA. Um, I met you at OCF, which is really great. Would you mind talking about your experience being a Michener student, um, essentially like specifically being a DHDA, DHDA student and also a Michener student at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Michener is, is quite, um, compared to where I did my undergrad, it's a smaller, tight-knit community, which I really enjoy. So the class sizes are smaller. Um, currently, I'm in a cohort of 18. So you really get to know your other peers very well, um, which is nice. Being digital, you still get to connect with others. Um, and at the same time, the instructors and the faculty that I've met so far have been very supportive and very approachable. Um, from the student experience side, there's lots of opportunities to get involved in extracurriculars. So for example, I'm in student council right now, which is great. Um, I'm actually from the Toronto area, so I like to get some in-person connections as well, although I'm in DHDA. Um, so it's nice being in student council and meeting other people on campus who might be from other programs as well. So, so far my experience has been very great. Yeah, it's nice to hear, Vanessa, that you have, um, you know, you are much more involved, especially in our student council. 
um, and then you're representing the BHDA program as well. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and last and final question, what would be your advice to future students of BHDA? So for applying, I would say get started early. Um, that doesn't mean you have to finish your application months in advance, but just looking at what is required. Um, part of it for me, and I think it's the same now, Amy can correct me, but um, I had to do an applicant experience checklist. So um, something to prove that I have um, clinical and digital experience. And I think possibly you don't have to have both, but just providing um, some experience that um, might be related to the program. And you also have to provide some letters to evidence those. So letters from employers or volunteer supervisors who can speak to those experiences. Um, so of course, when you're reaching out to get letters from other people, that can take some time. So it's best to, to kind of get a head start on that early. We also have to do, um, Actually, I don't think the immunization requirements would be part of it anymore because there's no placement, so scratch that. Um, but some advice for actually being in the program. Um, for me, it's a bit different because I, I still do work part time in research. Um, so for me, one of the most important things was time management. So learning how to balance um, school with work and extracurricular activities and life. Um, so really just making sure that you have a good grasp of your schedule and your deadlines and um, reaching out to instructors or TAs when you need help. Perfect. Thank you, Vanessa. I think um, I might not have asked this to um, Jennifer, our one of our um, student ambassadors this afternoon for MRI First Discipline, but so far like, um, how does your courses look like right now? You're in your first year, right? So um, how's your workload um, looking at this time? I think it's pretty manageable for me, at least. Like I work part-time 20 hours and then I do school. Um, it does vary week to week. Some weeks are busier than others if we have um, big assignments due, um, but it is manageable for me working part-time as well, which is nice. And DHDA is very convenient um, that all the courses are online so it does help you manage that time if you do want to um, continue to work part-time or full-time while you're in school. Um, so I have three courses right now. Two of them are more healthcare based. One is in um, in digital health, so an introduction to those types of technologies and the role that they play within our healthcare system. Another course is um, talking about the Canadian healthcare system itself. And then the last course is a, a programming course, so like a data science and analytics course. And um, Amy, I think, did a really good job of explaining what that looks like. So the synchronous three-hour lectures per week, um, but a lot of it is, is independent work with some group work as well. So there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to scheduling, which I think is a really big advantage. Amazing. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That's really, you know, a very... Um, good perspective from from your lens about like how the program works and then what made you decide to go into the DHBA program. So really appreciate that. And so that kind of wraps up all the program presentations and panel discussion. And we're moving on to the application process. So I'm going to um, pass the floor over to my colleague Dylan Maxwell. He's the admissions coordinator and he probably has been addressing most of your questions throughout the webinar. So over to you, Dylan. All right. So we are looking at three very distinct application processes. So uh, first, we'll talk about DHDA or Digital Health and Data Analytics. So as the general rule for Michener programs, we strongly recommend reviewing the admission requirements before you ever apply. Uh, the admission requirements that we publish on our website in our view book are absolute uh, and you must meet them entirely. So uh, please do ensure you review those first. Second of all, make sure, um, as uh, Vanessa alluded to, make sure you have all your documents in order. So get your transcripts ready, any supporting documents that might be required for your admission uh, for DHDA. We are looking for an applicant experience checklist and we wanna see your undergraduate degree. So make sure you have those documents ready. 
if you're internationally educated, uh, we do require you to have them evaluated by WES or ICAS, and it has to be course by course for WES or comprehensive for ICAS. So those are important steps. Uh, furthermore, there's important things like English language requirements. So if you're from a nation where English is not the dominant language, we do need an ELA as well. Um, and again, we're happy to answer any and all questions. So please uh, do let us know in the chat or send us an email. Uh, this The next step is kind of uh, the beginning of the end here. It's applying on Ontario colleges. So OCAS is the Ontario Colleges Application Portal. Um, all applications must be submitted there uh, with a deadline of the 1st of February, which is pretty much the same date every year, if not exactly the same date. Um, so once you apply on Ontario Colleges, uh, you will have until the 8th of February uh, to submit any and all documents for an equal consideration deadline. So that's the absolute deadline to submit your transcript and any supporting documents that you need. Uh, if you're applying while you're in progress of a degree or specific courses, we will need to see an official transcript with that degree and those courses for them to be considered for admission. So that's a very important date. That February 8th deadline is very important. Um, so now moving on to MRI first discipline, uh, very similar to the DHDA program uh, as the same deadline of the 1st of February. Um, we also require one extra step here, which is the CASPER test. Um, the CASPER tests are all approved dates for Michener. So uh, that we have um, a mandatory admissions assessment page on our website. I really strongly encourage anyone who is applying to visit that mandatory admissions assessment page because all of our dates for Casper that are pre-approved are published there. The most important date is February 22nd. That's the final date for completing the Casper date the test to be considered for admission. Um, and again, this February 8th deadline for all your documents is very important and absolute. Uh, and you'll notice here that the CASPER test is separate from your documents. So the CASPER test is a standalone admission requirement, and the dates that are published on our website are all acceptable. So you don't need to rush to complete the next one. You have until this February 22nd date uh, to fulfill that requirement. Lastly is our Fundamentals of Healthcare program. Um, the main difference here is the deadline, which is May 31st. So this is a bit of a longer time frame, uh, and the document submission deadline is also on the same date. Um, so on this next page, we will just discuss the tuition and other fees. Uh, we can see here for the DHDA program, uh, we're looking at a semester-based tuition, uh, so 3600 per semester. Uh, fundamentals of healthcare, as has been discussed, is uh, broken up into per course. Due to the, uh, the option and the nature of the program delivery, uh, each course will independently cost you $600. And then first discipline MRI, uh, we're looking at a 5,000 uh, with some ancillary fees, et cetera. As this is a brand new program, we still are developing um, absolutes, but uh, we do hope to have those published very shortly. So I have uh, myself and my colleagues have been attempting to answer any questions that have come in uh, into our chat as uh, as frequently as possible, but there are some that I have left for live Q&A. So I'm going to start from the top here. Um, I, I believe this was directed at MRI1D, but we can open it up to all programs because it could be of interest. Are the clinical placements at the same location? So... I think they're trying to get at where are they in general or how do they work possibly as well. We did address it, but can we, uh, Amy, for MRI 1D, what would the clinical placement locations vary like? Sure. Thank you. The, the clinical locations could be all over um, uh, GTA and around the province. Um, for MRI first discipline, there wouldn't be any moving around if you were placed in a in a single um, location. That's where you're going to spend your the majority of your um, placement or your entire placement. Does that answer the question for first discipline? I believe it does. Yes. Um, so moving on to our next question, 
Uh, this was also in regards to MRI, uh, but maybe again, we can address other things uh, such as DHDA because we have Vanessa here. Uh, how are the exams and testings for this program? So mainly, I guess, what is the exam slash test ratio? Is it at the end of the semester or I'm not really sure how this question, it's a very vague question, but. Yeah, and it's for DHDA? Uh, this was for MRI initially, but I think we can also address DHDA. Oh, oh, I see. Um, I mean, I can speak to just generally, it's a variety of, of um, assessment options. I really couldn't provide you with much more detail than that. Um, we try to seek a, a variety of different ways to assess students and not have any single ass assignment be overly heavy. So um, assessments and evaluations would be spread throughout the semester. And Vanessa, do you want to speak on your experience in the DHA program with exams and testing? Sure. Um, so far from my first semester, um, there I don't think there are final exams for my courses. One of my courses does have some multiple choice exams that are worth like 20 ish percent so like a reasonable um, amount that's not too overwhelming um, but as Amy um, was speaking to there is a wide variety of assessments which is nice there is um, some group work components which are important since you will be working in a team in in healthcare when you're um, when you finish graduating so for example um, I have a group debate tonight um, we have some some written papers. We have to critique some um, wireframes, which are basically um, some digital health um, things that you'll learn about when you're in the program. Um, but there is quite a big variety, which is nice. And I think that there are um, lots of opportunities to get marks and to Amy's point, um, a variety of options that would suit um, different learning styles, I think. Great, thanks. Moving on, um, this one is for you again, Amy. Uh, can you speak to what is what one is exactly learning in the fundamentals of healthcare program? I know that there, I personally know there's quite a variety of things being taught, but can you maybe address that question in a way that you think would be beneficial? Oh, ha, ha, ha. You're, I don't know how specific I can get, but I can certainly talk about the variety of courses that, that, that we're offering. We've talked about anatomy and phys, uh, physiology. We also have introduction to health and disease. Um, infection control would be something that, we'll, that you'd be learning about. And introduction to research methods and introduction to public health. Um, we're also exposing you to some digital health um, content as well. So the healthcare ecosystem behind the scenes is a digital health course. So, uh, I mean, you're really, you're learning a variety of things, not a specific um, few things, if that makes sense. It does. So it is quite the variety. Um, so here's yeah. another one for you. Uh, can FHC be a pathway towards MRI first discipline? Huh. That one I'd have to look, I'd have to look into. That one I have to look into. Um, Amy, but yes, it's possible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can, I can, um, I mean, I can address that. Thank you, Dylan, and thank you, Amy. So, um, one of the um things that has been, I mean, in the works is establishing pathways into um direct entry programs from FHC. So, one of the pathways that our senior leadership is looking into is pathways to towards the MRI first discipline, although that hasn't been firmed yet, but um, I would encourage for you guys to check our website. So, um, I mean, in a few months time, once that is much more, more robust. Thanks, Grace. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Um, uh, in regards to DHGIA, do we have any entry level job positions that uh, grads can be expecting to pursue? Um, well, I think I, I gave a description of the general areas. I don't know that I can give you specific job um, titles because we haven't collected that information yet. But um, like I said, um, let me just pull out my DHDA notes. Um, 
like we said, electronic medical records. Some of our students worked with Ontario Health or have worked with Ontario Health, the hospital sector, et cetera. And Vanessa, Sorry, I, I think you- provide anything. No, I, that's okay. And I think you were saying, Vanessa, you had somewhat of a healthcare background and you've, while in the program, you've continued to, you know, work within your prior area of expertise. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So I, I had a research job before coming in and I'm still in that research job right now. So I'm um, data collection and data management, but um, I could see how the digital health and data analytics program would could also play into like a research role if you're interested in like data analytics within research. Um, but there's quite a wide variety of places that you could work. Um, I think Amy named some of these as well, but like hospitals, maybe in their like IT department or quality and safety department, um, government agencies, private companies, like startups, anywhere really where we're involving like technology and healthcare together, um, anywhere you can imagine. Great. And now on the same kind of line of questioning, how about uh, opportunities to work and research uh, after successful completion of the fundamentals of healthcare program? Um, yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, really, it's I can't name specific jobs that that um, you'll be able to work in, but certainly you'll be set up more with a uh, a better knowledge and background of the healthcare system. And so you should be able to um, use those skills to apply for uh, different jobs in, in the healthcare environment. Great. Um, so I do not see any other additional Q&A questions. So uh, we'll leave about 20 seconds just in case there's any last questions and then we'll be moving to finish our webinar for the day. I Great, think Teresa. while we're waiting, Dylan, I just want to share because I, I've seen a couple of questions about OSAPs in particular for the MRI first discipline. So I just had, um, I mean, I had a word with our registrar. So the application process to get it approved for OSAP is currently in progress. Um, she's hoping to receive some feedback in late November. So if it becomes um, eligible for OSAP, which most likely it will be, it will be um, made available in our website, um, probably most likely in December. Great. Okay, Teresa, I think we can conclude our, our slides for today. So for those uh, in attendance, if you do uh, require any additional uh, information, we're happy to meet in our Ask Me, our Ask Mitchner ses sessions, which are held Wednesdays from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can sign up to those through our website. Uh, and furthermore, we'll be doing an admission requirements uh, presentation for all our full-time and part-time programs on the 7th of December, uh, probably in the exact same time slot as this. Uh, then following that in January, we will do a program spotlight uh, on digital health and data analytics. So we'll be going into more detail on basically what we've discussed today, but in further detail. And then lastly, on the 22nd of February, uh, we'll do the same, but for fundamentals of healthcare. So we'll hope to be able to provide more detailed answers um, in those presentations. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this is some of our social media and contact information, um, and we hope everyone enjoyed the presentation. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Dylan, for um, going over the last half of the slides. Um, this webinar is recorded, so we are going to post the recording um, by the end of the week. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to send an email to admissions at Michener, and we also encourage you to go for our um, weekly Ask Me sessions. It's, uh, it's really very helpful. So with that, um, on behalf of the admissions team, Dylan um, and Teresa, um, we would like to again thank all our participants for today, including our wonderful chair, Amy. Thank you for really speaking more about our newest programs. And then to our, um, to our PCL, um, Shahida, and our student ambassadors, 
Jennifer and Vanessa. Thank you so much, everyone. And it's been lovely to um, have this discussion with all of you and hopefully you find this information helpful. Thank you. Have a great evening.